it was not a sexual love affair because he buried his sexual feelings. But, you know, they exchanged gifts. He was overjoyed on meeting him, and he kept a couple of photographs of him on his table, even at the Siege of Mafeking, years after they'd met. The cult of manliness was common enough in Victorian England. Baden-Powell's interest in masculinity went further than most. On leave from India, he stayed several times at Charter House with Alexander Todd, an old school friend who'd become a master there. Todd was a keen photographer, and Baden-Powell was greatly impressed by his studies of scantily clad schoolboys. But he was more taken by Todd's pictures of naked boys in contrived poses, which the embarrassed school later destroyed. Todd's photos of trees and naked boys are excellent. He even wrote to Todd asking, might I possibly get a further look at those wonderful photographs of yours? There's no doubt at all in my mind that, that Baden-Powell's basic sexual orientation was what we would now call homosexual. Or if one put it in pure in psychological terms, he was a suppressed or repressed homosexual. And by that I mean he was homosexual in orientation but couldn't allow that in himself. It's well shown, I think, in his writings. For example, he, was, he loved to observe small boys in pictures or small boys undressed. He, he liked the, uh, watching male workers who were undressed. It's clear that he was a very homosexual in orientation, I think, but that doesn't mean that he was homosexual in practice. In fact, I think there's no evidence that he was. <laughs> Among the manly pursuits for officers of the Raj was hunting. But not for Baden-Powell, the hunting of big game, shot from a safe distance with rifles. His game was far more dangerous. Pig sticking, hounding down wild boar at top speed, armed with no more than a spear. A champion pig sticker, he wrote a book on the sport, and sketched all the illustrations. Hog hunting is a brutal sport, yet I love it. It is invaluable to our prestige in India, proving and preserving our rightful claim to superiority as a dominant race. And I believe the boar enjoys it too. In a letter home to his mother, Baden-Powell described with glee how he speared one particular beast. What joy to give him one and feel it going in beautifully. Now shut your ears and hold your tummy, mummy. One spear I gave him came out through his belly and stuck into the ground. That was a pretty vicious one. Executions were a popular spectacle a century ago. Baden-Powell would seek them out on his travels. He often sketched the victims. In China, he bought an executioner's sword as a memento. He once wrote of his desperate disappointment at missing an execution. This photo was from one of his albums, where he gave it the title, The Christmas Tree. One important aspect of his life and his personality was that he was sadistic in fact that he enjoyed cruelty. And so whether it was cruelty to animals in terms of pig sticking or cruelty to human beings in terms of the executions he enjoyed watching, he did, he did enjoy those things. And, what, and the positive thing is that at least he didn't actually express his aggression in, in, a, in a form that would hurt other people. It was his own private expression of his aggressive impulses. There must be something very deep in his nature that was responsible for it. Um, I'm pretty convinced that it was his very controlling mother who absolutely outlawed any kind of bad behavior, particularly temper tantrums. And he was denied her company a great deal in his childhood and always forced to do what really what she wanted. But of course, you can't sort of deny your anger and bury it completely. She said he didn't cry at all as a, as, as, as a young man. But it was going on underneath. The anger was still there. Um, and it leaked out in you know, his enjoyment of watching sadist sadistic spectacles. After 20 years in the Hazars, and with constant prodding from his mother, Baden-Powell had risen steadily to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. 
he'd become an expert in military scouting, developing new ideas on tracking, reconnaissance and camouflage. He wrote numerous books, which he rightly saw as a way of furthering his career. On completing reconnaissance and scouting, he wrote to his brother George, It'll be a grand advertisement for me, as I'm sending it to Wolseley and the other bosses to ask if they approve it. Field Marshal Lord Wolseley did approve and Baden-Powell's efforts to cultivate his patronage eventually paid off. In 1899, a chance encounter with Wolseley at his London club was to change his life and fortune. Wolseley had a knack of trying to spring surprises on you and was all the better pleased if you were not bowled out by them. He told me, I want you to go to South Africa. Can you go next Saturday? Knowing well the timetable of South African steamers, I replied, no ship on Saturday. I can go on Friday. A year later, he would return from his mission, the most famous man in England. Aidan Powell first became a household name after his legendary exploits in South Africa during the Boer War. His task was to divert as many enemy troops as possible away from the front line. Instead of fighting a guerrilla campaign in open country, he occupied the town of Mafeking and invited the Boers to attack. To that extent, the famous siege was self-imposed. Mafeking stands on the railway that Cecil Rhodes built a century ago, linking South Africa to Rhodesia. It was a vital supply line for the British forces. Surrounded by flat, dusty felt, it was not an easy place to defend. Baden-Powell ordered the land around the town to be cleared of scrub, so the enemy couldn't creep up unseen. Fortified trenches were built on the only vantage point in the area. He also indulged in boyish tricks to hoodwink the enemy. Baden Powell employed many clever tactics to fool his enemy. One in particular was the minefield, the fake minefield. The felt all around the town had little mines planted here and there, which were virtually boxes of sand, wires running back. Uh, one mine was a real one, had dynamite. Um, and he exploded this as a demonstration of mines being tested. Uh, I, I think that kept the Boers guessing for a few days at least. In addition to that, imaginary barbed wire was strung out on poles uh, and soldiers were seen to be stepping over this imaginary barbed wire, giving the impression, of course, that the town was uh, more securely defended than it really was. Baden-Powell's force of 900 men was outnumbered seven to one by the Boers. To help his cause, he organised a cadet corps from among the young white boys from the town. They were his lookouts and messenger boys. He later styled them the first boy scouts. Several were killed by shrapnel during the siege. He also enlisted the help of the Baralong tribe, whose village bordered the town. They would raid through the Boer lines at night in order to uh, take cattle away from the Boers, uh, which they would then hand over to Baden-Powell for feeding, particularly to the troops. Uh, this was a very important function, but uh, unfortunately uh, they weren't armed and they were often shot for their pains. Eventually the Baralong were armed, but they were then sent to the front line trenches where many more died. Baden-Powell did at least request that they be awarded campaign medals. The War Office refused even that. 